Right. Um, this is the first of the two talks which I have. They're building to some extent on top of each other. So you might think 90 minutes is a lot of content. Uh, when I would give this talk, so I have versions of this, which I would probably be able to talk to you for a week about, about this. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't really, ex expectation is not really that you will be able to be do much with this and understand these kind of things. This is just to raise interest, just like it is the case for most conference talks. So don't be too disappointed if you are not able to sit down and immediately be an expert in these kind of things. But at the same time, the, the topic, so especially PMCs, is of course nothing new. And people were in the very early days, of course, expecting, oh yeah, it's very easy to use because they're telling me exactly what is going wrong with my program. So in the first version of this, so the first part of this talk, so I, I will hopefully be able to dispel this myth a bit so that you actually realize that you have to do quite a bit of work to understand what, actually, what is meant by this. So, and where's the, this misconception coming from? So, in the, so those who are old enough might remember machines where we had instructions being executed nicely, sequentially, and so on. We always had a nice series of sequences each processor went through. So this started from the early on. So if you look at the 8008, the Intel processor, the 8080 ones, and so on, they all had these nice stages. Each instruction went through a couple of memory cycles, and so on. And each of them were executing part of an instruction and so on. We know exactly how a program was behaving. We just had to look at the instruction and look up how many cycles its instruction would take and we knew exactly what the throughput is. And from that we were expected, uh, we were able to compute how, how fast it is and we were able to see, well, if we make this and this and this change, how much faster does the program become? So this already was weakened by the introduction of pipeline processors where now instead of having just one single instruction in fight, we have multiple instructions which can be executed in parallel. So they are not executing the same stage. So this is something which was uh, early on added. So uh, by recognizing that the individual stages are executed to some extent by different parts of the CPU, so why not keep all of the parts busy by executing different stages of each instruction. So each instruction is here, one of these horizontal bars. This is an instruction and the yellow part is indicating that at any point in time you have from ideally from one instruction, one part being executed at that point in time. And the result is that we can have, in this case, in a typical five stage pipeline, up to five instructions in flight at any point in time. So, of course, usually this is not the case that if you have a program which completely maps to this kind of execution scheme all the time. So you have bubbles in there, you have dependencies at which you cannot start with the execution of one instruction until you actually have the results of a prior instruction, etc. At which point some of these rows basically are empty and then the instruction throughput falls. So this is something which meets uh, performance estimates quite a lot harder. It still was possible because it was predictable in the sense that memory accesses, etc. back in the days when these kind of uh, process architectures were prevalent, so memory accesses were still mostly predictable because the CPU core speed and the memory speed have not yet diverged that much from each other and therefore uh, we were still able to estimate to some extent what the time is, but we frequently and very early on got help in the form of what is usually called a timestamp counter of some sort. So on the x86 front, this was introduced in the 586 already back in the days where we had a dedicated register where at any point in time we were able to request a number, 64-bit number in this case, which were indicating how many cycles of some sort have been uh, uh, have elapsed since the beginning of whatever, so usually the reboot of the last reboot of the machine. And by subtracting the two numbers, each of the numbers got assigned to one cycle. And by subtracting two numbers, we knew exactly how many cycles were between the inside and interval which we want to measure. 
So this was useful, so we also could estimate at the very least how many instructions were executed and therefore like cycles per instruction, which up to this day is a very important measure. And we could able to estimate therefore how effective a program was executed and we also were able to measure what kind of effects a certain change to a program actually had. So these were absolute numbers and we were able to use them to effectively measure how a program behaves. So this kind of thing is still possible today for some of the simpler processes, so which you mostly find in the embedded realm. So you, they are not usually out of order execution processes so as they are called, so they are just in order, just like this. Maybe they have simple five-stage pipelines like this as well, and this is still a very valid method if it applies. So, but hardly anyone outside the realm of the embedded development world is using this type of process until today. It more looks like this. So I always like to answer, uh, ask the question, what is it? Because the connoisseur of microarchitecture will know exactly what it is. No one. It's it's obviously Sunnycove core. Oh, I was trying to figure out what, which CPU was. It? Yeah, well, no, no, that, that's a core. It's just this is just an x86 core implementation, not the CPU, the entire CPU, just a single core, and more specifically the Sunnycove architecture, not Skylake, the next generation after Skylake. That's what this is. So this looks like a complicated picture and it is even more complicated when you're actually using the thing because basically all of these arrows, all of these boxes which are you see here are individually acting parts of the system which can or cannot at any point in time work on something or not work on something, etc. They're, in, they're introducing problems related to uh, overuse, they're introducing problems because they are, well, they are dependencies, etc., etc. So, quite honestly, every single line which you see here has some importance when it comes to analyzing program performance, which you're actually running on these kind of things. And to understand and explain the performance of program, you would have to, at, for every single uh, sequence of uh, instructions, you would have to see what is actually going on in the CPU and explain this based on these individual pieces. And I even left out here completely on the right hand side, you see there, there's a connection to the other cores, or more correctly, first of all, to the what is Intel is calling uncore parts, the parts which are supporting all the cores, to which, among other things, the main memory and the last little cache are attached. So these things are even left out here, and those are today, with uh, what I mentioned before, the discrepancy in speed between the uh, the cores and the memory, where the memory is orders of magnitude slower than that, so that we have to introduce caches, etc. and so on. But they are also introducing uh, inconsistencies, they're introducing randomness in the execution, so couple all of these kind of things together means that you are today absolutely not capable of describing how a program is really behaving when it is executing on such a core. It's absolutely impossible. There's, there's so much randomness going on that one run to the other, it will behave differently, period. So, but even if this would not be there, as I said, just look at the number of different things which are mentioned here. And as I said, all of them have their own, uh, own uh, manifestation when it comes to the uh, utilization of the various instructions this, uh, you, your program is using on top of the CPU. Each of them, you would have to model and understand how they're interacting with each other. This is truly impossible. So, and in addition to that, we have the problem that the programs we are running, so even if you, tr if you try to say, yeah, yeah, I can try to understand this for my program, this is not what uh, uh, the, the next program will, be, uh, will do. So the, the different programs can stress different parts of the CPU completely differently. 
And therefore, one analysis doesn't translate at all to the next one. Every single program has to be analyzed individually. And even that is a simplification, because a program usually is not homogenous in, in over time in what it is actually executing. So at the very least, every program has a startup phase of some sort, then it has a perhaps some I.O. phase, some compute stuff, then perhaps another I.O. phase, and then perhaps it repeats the whole thing, etc. So all these different phases and so on are stressing the system differently, and you would have to map the different phases to the different parts of the code and then to the, uh, to the appropriate uh, units inside the CPU and make an analysis for each of these uh, different phases instead of for the program as a whole. So you see, this is a tremendously hard problem nowadays. And we need help. So what is actually possible today is, of course, this is not something which is unobserved by the folks who are actually producing these kind of machines for us, so obviously. So let's start by a nice little analogy. So I'd like to give as, as an example here, assume you have a pipe system. So any physicist here know something about hydrodynamic? So don't, we don't use water, we use a compressible, uh, some compressible fluid in, fluid. in this case, it's a easy, it's a nicer map. Assume you have something coming out, coming in the, and the, at the top, and you want to somehow control or whatever the, the way it comes out in the end. So you have different ways it can move, different uh, length of pipes, you have valves in different places and so on, and at any point in time they can behave differently. And you want to compute something like this. This is a somewhat rough analogy of what is going on in, in the big CPU system, where you have problems with different diameters of things, so which corresponds to different sized pathways inside the CPU, be it for just transport or for calculation and so on. You have uh, different lengths, so it takes different amount of time for the material to be transported through that, which by itself, of course, is regulating the flow, so we have these kind of things inside the CPU where the performing and addition is very fast, while if you have something like an, uh, a division to be executed, that by its nature of the operation will take a longer amount of time. Uh, we have uh, the equivalent of valves which are closed or opened, so if they are closed, so the, the pathway is not able uh, to be used in this case. Similarly, we have shared resources in the CPU which for the execution of a specific program for some period of time might not be available. So this has to be taken into account. We also have the thing that we might only be able to extract and insert into the system uh, material at a certain rate, a maximum rate. Well, which means that even if we are doing something in the middle which is fantastically uh, high performing, and it, it can transport as much as we want, well, it will not have a positive effect because we cannot produce or consume appropriate uh, amounts of material, or in this case, in our case here, instructions. So we have, of course, limitations when it comes to the, uh, reading the code from, from data, from the memory, or storing data and reading data and so on, which puts an absolute limit as to what we can consume and produce, and this kind of thing translates to the system as well. Finally, what I have is there is that the so, uh, available, uh, of, uh, so the, the material which is transported over, whatever comes in at the top must also uh, go out at the bottom. So we, this means that they are not independent of each other. We cannot just arbitrarily long consume more because the volume, internal volume of the system, which the, in, in the CPU sense, the number of instructions which can be stored as being in flight is finite. And actually, it's a really reasonably small number. Depending on the complexity of the CPU, it can grow. So nowadays, we can, in theory, have 100 instructions for going on before any of them has to be what is called retired, before they actually uh, are terminating, but there is a fixed limit as to that. And we have to take all of these kind of things into account when we're analyzing the program. 
because at some point we might make assumptions about how the program is done, but any of these limits and so on might be violated and therefore our assumptions are wrong. So it's very difficult uh, to, to use, to look at the individual pieces, but then also have to keep, keep all these boundary conditions in, in, in mind when we're actually analyzing the code. So let's go back to the picture which you saw before. So what can actually go wrong when we are uh, executing code there? And this is a tiny, tiny little subset of what is possibly going on. In some situations, we are actually calling them hazards. So these are things where during the program execution, something is not right and we have to do something, usually meaning waiting. So, and I, I'm not reading through them here right now so completely, so it doesn't really matter. You just see that we have different types of situations in which we are waiting for something to happen and they are mapping to individual pieces in the actual uh, CPU core. And execution of a CPU as an instruction inside the core actually works not randomly in some there. So they actually follow a path through this core implementation. At the very top there you will see the level one uh, instruction cache which feeds the data coming in which is the program into the instruction decoder and etc so which translates the uh, assembly language the binary code into something the CPU can actually work on so guys by the way whoever thinks x 6 is a CISC architecture so really doesn't know how CPUs work every, every CPU nowadays is a RISC architecture because the first thing an x86 processor does, it translates every instruction into risk instructions, which are called micro-ops in Intel terminology. So the instructions get translated into these micro-ops and then they are put in the waiting queue and then when all the preconditions are met plus the appropriate unit which can perform the action which the individual micro-op is, is asking for, then it gets executed and after the execution the result might linger around for a while until the logic of the, in the, the sequence of instructions tells it oh yeah by that time now the result of this instruction can be used it is, has been verified that this is the right way of doing things and therefore the results are written in, in the permanent state so there are all kinds of instructions in this reorder buffer and so on. There can be hundred instructions going on and floating around at any point in time. Usually it's not that many because the program has too many possibilities to actually run into hazards and therefore uh, you, you rarely feel this kind of thing but really really well written code with lots of uh, linearly executed instructions could potentially fill the uh, reorder buffer completely and therefore make the processor really happy because it can just uh, issue many many instructions right away and the number of instructions which are executed at any point in time is also something which has changed over time so in the beginning I mentioned we are working on one single instruction at a time then in the pipeline methods up to five instructions here we can potentially issue four or five depending on the architecture micro instructions per cycle to be executed to the individual what they are calling here uh, pipelines and so on and inside the pipelines we can have multiple in some of the other pipelines they are not finishing in one single cycle and they can have multiple instructions in each of these pipeline stages as well so you have not only a couple of instructions, dozens, hundred instructions to be uh, decoded at any point in time, you might even have a dozen of instructions being executed at the same time and that perhaps every single cycle. In fact, if you do the analysis on normal code on Exodus 6 uh, today, if you have the, if the number of instructions which at any point in time is executed at the same time or issued from the reorder buffer to the execution part. If this dips below two, you know your program is in really, really deep trouble. We are, we are aiming for 
uh, instructions uh, per cycle, which is uh, another measure which is quite important. For, so we want to have the IPC value to be larger than two, maybe even larger than three at any point in time for the program. And so that's, that's a good, well-performing program. Anything low is really, really bad. So you can, you can imagine there are so many things going on. And at any of these kind of stages so represented here by these red dots, something can go wrong. They're all kinds of different things. They're mapping to caches, to the behavior that you might actually don't find the data in the caches, or you have to write something out, or you have a dependency of one instruction on the next instruction. They all are mapping to different parts uh, of the CPU itself. So it's not that you can isolate, in, in isolation look at any individual part. You have to look at the whole thing completely and try to find out by feedback from the CPU what your program actually is in lack of in, in most situations. So, and just to make sure, so this is, uh, as I said, one of the last, last generation Exodus 6 cores. This is not uh, unique to that. So here is a new picture, one of the new pictures which I brought this time around. This is an ARM Cortex A72 core. So you probably have never seen it exactly in this form, so I, said, I, I drew this myself to map somewhat closely to what the x 6 core that you saw on the previous slide is looking like. And that's not that much difference. So especially if you're a little bit under, not really that well versed in microarchitecture of CPUs, you, you're forgiven if you think it's pretty much the same. So we have the same thing, we have different, uh, different ports in which different types of instruction can be executed. You have various cache sub levels, you have decoders, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem is exactly the same, regardless of what kind of CPU you're using, as long as it's not one of these very trivial ones, these microcontrollers or so on. So the problem we have to solve is not unique to the big core Exodus 6. It's a general problem. The thing which I also should point out at this point, so the a number of points which I have here on the right-hand side is, in this case, a little bit uh, uh, shorter than the list which I had on the previous slides. But all of the points which you see here on the right hand side are also present on the previous slide. So they are easy to map specific events which, be, which are causing problems to whatever architecture the CPU core is actually having. So it's not that every single architecture has a completely different set of hazards in which, uh, which we have to look into. There are, there's a lot of commonality there how and exactly where we find them and perhaps how we can observe them might differ from the one CPU to the next. But if we are looking at with a little bit of abstraction, that's something which we can actually do. So and that's something which we're going to look at now. But more importantly before we actually getting to the point is simply that the concept of a counter has been introduced uh, fairly, fairly uh, long time back as, was, as I mentioned. The TSC, the timestamp counter, was introduced in the 586. Soon after that, in 686, we got the first, uh, the, the first instances of programmable uh, counters inside, so measurement counters inside the CPUs. Um, Exodus 6 was not really the, the architecture at the forefront of these kind of things. Quite honestly, back in those days, the, the, the architecture, which was most prominent uh, when it comes to these kind of things was the DEC Alpha. So Joe might actually like that, uh, the shout out. So um, DEC Alpha was ahead of its time when it came to these kind of things. They had these kind of performance counters all throughout the CPU. And they have the, uh, the, uh, the, the one of the concepts behind these uh, performance counters is that yes, it would in theory be possible to have for every single of these hazards and whatever kind of things, event you might want to count, we could have an individual counter assigned to them. So the logic which you need for that is actually pretty small. But the thing about them is that just as counters, these kind of things are not really that useful. We need a little bit of additional logic to it. We need to not only uh, measure things, but we also want to have something where we can uh, react to the counter being incremented in a general way. So we are getting back to this kind of thing. 
in a bit, but in general we want to be able to say when you have 4,000 of times this event happening, happening, for instance, you missed the level one catch, then let the program know that this actually happened. So we have some logic associated with, with the counters, and this pretty much makes it impossible to have uh, one, thousands or hundreds or, or thousands of these counters spread all throughout the, the core implementation and have them available and so on. So what actually happened is that uh, pretty much every CPU since then provides us per core with a certain number of programmable performance counters in which you can basically say assign at any point in time a specific, specific event to. So this became much more sophisticated as the time went by. So in the early days we had, I think, two or three on Exodus 6 performance counters and each of the counters could only be assigned events from a certain class, etc. So these kind of things. Nowadays we have a lot more. So if you turn off hyperthreading, I think we have eight counters available per core and they can be pretty much freely assigned any of the events. The number of events is going in the hundreds now. So if you want, I have, uh, have a spreadsheet where, for instance, for Skyly Core, where all of these, they are listed. The list is long. It's incredibly long. For, for, you have so much choice to actually uh, select whatever event you want to count. So you can assign pretty much any of them to arbitrary counters and for each of the counters they have an interrupt logic where you can say after n of these counters and so on, counted, counted events, raise an interrupt. So this is all possible. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Alpha was at the forefront of that and they, the engineers at DAC back in the days when they were not compact yet, uh, they were actually good and they wrote a seminal paper about statistical profiling, which was the first one uh, which was able, uh, where we actually learned how we should program or, uh, debug and profile uh, these, these kind of large programs. And they have used this functionality of, of interacts from performance measurement counters. So um, the quality of implementation of a CPU is, is really determining the number of counters which are available for you to use. But not only that, also the CPU vendors are charging you more the more counters there are. Or the other way around, they are disabling counters if you don't pay them enough. <laughs> so specifically on an, uh, an XD6, uh, if you're even looking at the, at the low end one, ignore this, even, even the normal i5, i7 cores which you can buy nowadays, they are crippled in their core implementation. Theoretically, they could have huge numbers of counters, but those are reserved for the uh, expensive one, either the i9s or the Xeon cores, which are basically the same. So there's only the only difference in there is the size of the level one, uh, the uh, level two cache, and so on. The rest is pretty much the same for all these kind of cores, except that the expensive ones have uh, more counters for you available. So, which means that people like me, for our workstations, we have to buy the expensive ones, unfortunately. So, it also means that if you want to do this kind of work on your laptop, yeah, it's hard because you don't have this functionality. So, don't be discouraged if you try to do some of these things and then do it on laptop or on your small machine and so on, you're not getting far. That's by design. Not by my design, but by some <laughs> evil people who want to charge you money for that. All right, so in the, finally there's one other aspect which is important. So I showed you the picture of the x or ARM, the Cortex core, and those were just the pictures of the core. But parts of what the performance, which is also governing the performance, is obviously the part which the cores are connected to, the memory, the, le the last level cache, these kind of things. So we also need counters there, and that's a problem. How do you govern the reading of values which are not really directly attached to your core? How can you do this in a fast enough time without delaying things where at the same time you might have uh, requirements from every single core attached to the uncore part and they want to read out the same value. So if you know something about electric, so electronic design, you know that reading out from the same value is actually a big, big problem. It's got fed out. 
So these kind of things are very hard to implement, right? So you have certain things which are in the uncore parts which need to be available on a kind of a bus system which makes it slow, blah, blah, blah. So all kinds of problems. I'm not going to the details here, but in general, the a good implementation still provides you with pretty much the same level of information for the uncore parts, except, of course, they cannot be done with somewhat the same precision, especially when it comes to the time resolution. Because the, uh, the, the time a, cork, the, 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 a single core is taking is at a higher resolution than what the uncore parts does, and more importantly, the, the clocks might not be completely in sync. So the attribution of events might actually not be exactly matching what you're, what you're seeing. So there are therefore two at least two classes of these kind of events we are looking at. There are the core events and there are the uncore events. And yeah, we have to uh, treat them carefully when we're analyzing them. So this I already mentioned most of the parts already. So as I said, the thing is that the it's not just about providing counters it's also to do something with them so the one thing which i haven't mentioned here is that in the over the years we always had what is called uh, machine specific or uh, version specific counters pretty much everywhere over time we it, it clarified which of the events we pretty much always want to count and so some of these counters actually were what is called architected. Again, into terminology, architected just means that they were elevated. They were, say, from now on, every single future CPU will have to, will provide this kind of event as well. So we don't have to select this. And therefore, they actually dedicate specific hardware to these kind of events. So in, on the most recent CPUs, you will find that in addition to the timestamp counter, you will also get uh, counters for the number of instructions which have been executed, etc. So they are always there. So you don't have to uh, reserve some of the precious resources of the other PMCs for counting these events. But this is something which varies from CPU version to the other. So it's some older ones don't have that. So when you're trying to use these kind of things at some point, if you're trying to use, for instance, six different events, which easily map to the four PMCs plus the, uh, plus the fixed sites, uh, counters and so on, which you have available on any kind of, let's say, Skylake like X machine, uh, if you try to do the same thing on a Haswell or previous machine, you will not perhaps do, be able to do this because it doesn't have that many independent PNCs available for you to count. So these kind of things you have to keep in mind. There will always be differences, and the difference will be even larger if you're trying to do the same terminology, not just for, the, for having Exodus 6 on Intel, but also Exodus 6 on AMD, which will have a completely different set. So their, their core implementation is different, so also the counters will be different. And even more problems you will have if you're trying to do the same thing on other architectures, like, for instance, the ARM architecture, if you try to use the same, uh, the same kind of terminology. So it's possible. You just have to be a little bit more careful, and your programs which are doing this have to be aware of these limitations and work around them. Good news is that uh, the tools we have available nowadays can do this. So what if you want to uh, actually monitor many of these events and the number of counters which you have available is too small? Well. We can still use that, but we use the same trick we use everywhere, time multiplexing. And if you are not aware of the limitations of the number of counters which you have, the tools usually will silently move you into this mode, in the time multiplexing mode. And the, this has, of course, results. Because what they are doing, basically, is, and here's an example of, so, you, you're dividing up your program execution in intervals of certain lengths, tau in this case, and every tau, whatever time this is, after the duration and so on, you're switching to a different set of events which you're counting, perhaps, in your PMCs. And the result might be that it looks like this. If you have four counters available, certain events are swapped in, swapped out, and in the end, you have some leftover interval, and the good program which uh, 
which allows you to monitor these kind of events will actually tell you, yeah, I have gone through, was it eight event cycles and then 0.8 of the last event cycle. And here are the counts for all of these in events in all of these specific intervals. So all of the information which you see here being in could be accessible when it comes to the termination of program and for us to actually analyze code. So the result is that we can create a table like on the uh, right hand side. More correctly, we can look at the first three columns. So first one, of course, being the name, but we can reconstruct the uh, total count and the total time the uh, individual event was being counted. We can reconstruct this from the data the, uh, the performance analysis tools are providing us with. But now comes the important point if you're not aware of this, or if you deliberately are using more events than there are counters available, interpolation happens. So we know that the total program execution time is 8.8, .8, and any measure we want to print, uh, print out has to be based on the same time basis. The only time basis which makes sense is the full length of the program, and therefore, events which are not counted for the entire duration of the program run will be multiplied appropriately in their count, and therefore, they have a much lower uh, precision than the other ones. Specifically, if your program is not homogeneous over the execution time, if you have, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have some startup phase, then you have, have some compute phase, and perhaps the compute phase by itself is varying over time. If your event were scheduled in time, so for, for instance, low arithmetic uh, activity, but you're counting an arithmetic event, well, the interpolation which you're getting out of this in the end will be completely off. On the other hand, you can have exactly the same opposite effect. You're only counting arithmetic events in the short period of times when you're doing actually arithmetic in the program and you're overestimating this. From the counters themselves and from the programs, there is no way that you can get this kind of information out of this. At best, what you can do is you can run it multiple times and hope that there's enough randomization there that the events are not coinciding at the same time with the same kind of parts of the program execution, etc. But much better it would be and if your program is actually repeatable, so it's reliably repeatable, would it it would be to not rely on time multiplexing, but instead use multiple runs of the same programs with different set of event counters. But again, this is not something the tools like Perf will tell you at this point. They, they will just say, well, yeah, here, here's the result. Be happy with it. You have to be actually looking actively for that. So that was a lot of complexity already, but it gets even worse to some extent because, you know, how do we actually use this? So if we want to use these kind of tools by ourselves. And uh, so if we are measuring the numbers which you're getting out of the counters, counters obviously are providing us with absolute values. So if the program is executing 4 billion CPU cycles and it does 1 million memory writes. So this is an, is an output which a performance analysis tool can give us about the program. Is this good or bad? It's a variance. It doesn't matter. So you can re repeat it, I, I can say I've repeated many times and perhaps it's plus minus a tenth of a percent. So it doesn't matter in this case. The question is not about the variance. So is this good or bad? I mean, the variance of the data has Yeah, no, so, but in this case it doesn't really matter. So because the point here is not how reliable is the data, but if this is a program which computes the state of the universe at this point in time, I would say it's a fantastic program. If it's a program which computes the time of day, I would say it's a lousy program. This is not enough information for us to say it's a good program or not, regardless of what the variance is. We have to look at every single of the values of a performance counters in a context. And the most reliable way to do this is to actually look at ratios. So 
A long-running program obviously will take half more cycles, but perhaps it is actually a, a, an expected result. If a program does more computation, obviously it runs longer. So therefore, getting a ratio which basically says, so we are going back to the numbers on the previous slide, how many memory operations we are doing per cycle, that's a more reasonable value to look at. And there we can potentially argue then, saying that that's just a reasonable, it's a good value, it's a bad value. So ratios are the foundation of performance and analysis when it comes to these things. So at, at the top level, to actually make judgment calls. When it comes later on to the actual process of optimizing a program where we want to see whether a certain change makes a, an advance in our program, so it, it improves the program perhaps, then absolute value certainly will make, uh, make a comeback because then we could say for the same input, the program now uh, produces uh, or requires now 10% less cycles. That's an absolute judgment call. It's definitely possible. But for a general analysis of the performance of a program, absolute values are useless, pretty much, and we need to rely on ratios. So ratios are everywhere. I mentioned already a couple of them. For instance, CPI or IPC, they're, they're reverse of each other, cycles per instruction. So having a CPI value, which is even one, uh, 0.5 or higher, indicates usually for the CPU that's something that's wrong, so for an x86 CPU. For an ARM CPU, I would argue that probably that's not actually that much of a problem in many situations. So especially for if you have in-order execution cores, then you don't have this kind of thing. So they, even the ratios have to be uh, looked at in the context. But uh, if you are looking at an environment, a homo so an, an homogeneous environment, for instance, an Exodus 6 server application of a, where a program does a certain amount of work, comparing the ratios is actually a very reasonable thing. But here again, uh, think back to the problem which I mentioned with time multiplexing. So because you're dividing one by the other, and if one of them is small, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the variance you would get out of the time multiplexing numbers can completely uh, make the, the outcoming ratios useless. So you also have to be very, very ca careful when you're doing this kind of thing. So ratios which, as I said, CPI is one of them. Another one which definitely makes sense is number of cache misses per arithmetic operation or per memory uh, operation. Things like that, which are common sense when you're thinking about what your program does, they all are uh, going to be making an appearance when you're doing uh, the performance analysis of your program. One of the other ones which are worthwhile mentioning at this point is the probability of a branch miss. Branch misses creating bubbles in the CPU, which are one of the worst offenders when it comes to, uh, to actually uh, creating badly performance programs. So if you have a probability of branch misprediction of, let's say, even 20%, your program sucks and the, the performance as well. So things like that are easy targets for one to try to measure just without even looking at the inner details of a program. Getting these kind of top-level measurements is actually very useful. So, Going back to the problem or similar problem uh, uh, example which we had before. So if you have two counters, you're measuring them. So, but how do you now compute these various ratios? So for instance, how do you compute the CPI value? Do you take, for instance, the cycle and the number of retired instructions from the first interval, divide them, and produce perhaps in this case five different values? That's useful. You would know how the program is evolving over time, but uh, perhaps this is not always uh, the, the data is not always available. Not so it will fluctuate quite dramatically. So perhaps you want to instead uh, sum up the values. But here you, you see that we are counting the number of cycles every single time, every single time interval, but we are counting the number of instructions only once because we have a limited number of counters. How do you compute it then? Do you 
average out the number of cycles per interval and divide it by 66. So if you're any kind of scientist at this point, you will say you will try to associate the time intervals with units and you will say, oh no, it doesn't work. Because you're putting in the same equations completely unrelated values. The 66, for instance, has nothing to do with the 95 uh, cycle count of the second time interval. It just happens to be that if we would have measured the ret number of retired instruction in that time interval, we might have gotten a number in this neighborhood as well. But it has absolutely no foundation in you believing this is the case. Still, if you have few resources available for you to actually measure these things, this might be the best hope you can get. But it means that you have to be aware of the fact that this number is noisy and not an absolute number. And oftentimes you will see then programmers, of course, quoting out the numbers with seven digits after the digit, yeah. after the decimal point. So it's, it's, it's stupid. But this also means that simply pro people are not thinking about it. So for the misprediction here, in this case, we have values always measured at the same time. But which of them are you looking at? So do you always look at the, the sums when they are available or not? Because in some situations, you might actually want to know what, how a specific part of the program is behaving. So it's becoming very quickly, very much a big data problem. I like to throw out this keyword here. Uh, because we can measure huge numbers of values and all of a sudden you have uh, the, the ability, well, well at least you have the possibility, uh, to do all kinds of computations on that. And the possibility that you're doing something stupid if you don't know how the CPU works is really, really high. All right, so the important thing is that the, you need to do adjustment, for instance, for situations when your program is not run, doing counting certain events. But if you're doing this, you are introducing possible errors, and you have to keep them in mind when you're doing all kinds of analysis based on that. So I've told, told you all about all these kind of nice things and whether we can use them and also bad things to not use them. So how do, would we actually use them? So the step which I mentioned before, these ratios for an entire program are useful to get an overview. But after that, we actually want to learn something more about the program as it proceeds because just getting an overview and saying, well, your program runs with a CPI uh, of um, a five, which is bad. So just saying that about the program is not enough. You actually need to be able to say, well, where in my program am I actually wasting that much time? And for that, you have a couple of different possibilities. At the very least, you can go and actually analyze explicitly certain parts of a program and measure how they are behaving there, etc. So this is very much possible, but it's not too time consuming because that's not an easy way to inject the measurement code in your program code, perhaps in the binary or in the source code, to get this for all kinds of combinations of function calls, et cetera, et cetera, these kind of things. The easier way, and this is back to the seminal paper from DAC back in the days, they introduced statistical profiling as something which doesn't require modification of the binary and where you can still learn from the outside without doing anything to the binary or the source code about the program as it behaves over time, but with a limited precision. So both of these methods are useful and should be applied, but uh, none of them are really providing us with one definitive answer. So for instance here, um, I have another nice little example. I don't know whether it's nice, but going back to the count which we have seen before. So we could use these measurements uh, and not just as a single value, as we have seen it before, but we could do it something like that, where we have uh, we compute uh, the two values, the CPI, seconds per instruction, and the branch miss predictions, predictions over time. So in this case here, we have 
uh, the, uh, the red lines so indicating CPI and the green lines are indicating the, uh, the mispredictions and we get a picture which looks like this. But it means that for many parts of the program one ratio or the other is not, not present. That's again back to the time multiplexing problem. So we have to either live with this or we can work around this in many situations. So we can also try to do something else, but in general, what you get out of this is just these, these numbers. It says just based on the time the program is executing, here are the points at which the ratio is this. Note there is something missing, which is the reference back from these time periods inside the code or inside the flow of the program code itself. This is not provided by just observing these values you need something else. So as I said before, there are these two ways. The first one is obviously we can use explicit counting. There are interfaces available where ordinary user level programs can access these kind of counters. The interface which I've been using forever for a very long time is called Poppy, P-A-P-I. And it allows you to create event sets and so on and then just say Poppy read and it reads out the state of certain counters. Period. Very simple. These come out come 64 bit values which we can store somewhere, and subsequent calls of this will, uh, will return different absolute values. And the difference of them, obviously, is the time spent or number of events between two different calls. So, this is easily doable, but as I said, you would have to integrate this kind of code in every single function of interest inside your program. It's something which I personally do when it comes then to measuring the effects of a certain change, because then the absolute values are definitely useful. I can use it also to compute ratios, obviously, but it, it's usually too much time to try to cover the entire program with that. So the other one is, as I mentioned before, statistical uh, analysis. And the picture which you see here is very similar to what you have seen before these, these uh, uh, what, what I tried to show you there where certain events are counted at any point in time and so on. We are counting the absolute values. Now the difference here is that instead of just counting the events, we are asking the processor to, to say that every single time event one has been seen five times, give me a notification. And similarly, for event two, every single time it was uh, called, uh, which was, was incremented 10 times. So this is why you see at the top there, at user level part, the program being executed. And after hit event one five times, immediate race and interrupt, some kernel code get executed, which not only does the counting of this event, but also because it's an interrupt, it can actually query where the program was interrupted and it can remember this information. And with modern CPUs, there's so much additional information which we can collect because there's something like called the LBR, last branch, uh, last branch um, was it registers and so on, where basically we, we can know where the program was before. So this kind of information can be recorded and then the program is resumed. So the counter gets reset basically. If it again hitches five, it, we have a new interrupt and the same thing happened for, for the second one. The result is that we are collecting through these interrupts not just the information about the total number of the events which have happened, but also getting statistical information about where did the events happen. And by the way, limits 5 and 10 are unrealistic. Where on a normal CPU, we're counting them in multiples of 2,000 or 4,000, something like that, because these events happen so frequently. But this means that we get information about the locality, the program, where inside the program certain operations are predominant. And by measuring different events over the same program execution in different runs, we know, for instance, where is memory heavy stuff, where is arithmetic heavy stuff, and so on. We can map this to the source code, or first of all to the binary code, and then to the source code. And the, this sounds good, this sounds almost too good, but we have to be aware of the fact that the resulting information is really coarse-grained. It's statistical, because we only get interrupted every 
in this case, five or ten times. In reality, 2,000 or 4,000 times the event happened. So if we have a piece of code which by accident is where an arithmetic, for instance, instruction is executed exactly every 2,000 uh, 2, times, and the rest of them uh, are, the rest of the arithmetic instruction happens something completely differently, we can see completely different results. This is statistics. And we have to be aware of this when we also have to apply many of the statistical uh, analysis techniques to the data. Unfortunately, still isn't done because, well, you actually have to know statistics for that. So the accuracy is limited by that. The accuracy is also limited by the fact that we have uh, out of order execution course. So if you have up to 100 instructions to be executed at any point in time and you have an interrupt being raised, it's actually not that easy, and you can imagine why, to, uh, to, to actually fault a specific instruction for the, the event. How do you actually find out one of these 100 instructions, which is exactly the one which is, has been causing this event? So this has been solved in some, uh, some latest iterations of the CPUs, but there's a lot of effort went into this. So Intel introduced what is called PEBS, Precise Event-Based Sampling, I think about 10 years ago, and they have improved it ever since. And uh, we can see this, that there are different levels of this by the way you have to interact inside the PERF program, which comes from the last kernel. Uh, interact with this, so you have to add a colon p or a colon pp or a colon ppp or a colon pppp to the event name to request the special level of precision you're actually asking for. So these things are not as easy to do, So, but they are possible for some of the events nowadays because they have been proven to be useful, but it meant that, that the silicon manufacturers actually have to spend a lot of cycles on implementing this correctly. So let's see of an exactly example how this works in reality. And I'm really limiting myself to, to puppy I've already seen. So perf is now the one. That's a program which come, is part of the Linux kernel after earlier efforts in the form of the O profile program. Always were lingering around because they were in, developed independently of the kernel and the interface never matched up. Uh, at some point, the kernel developers got sick of it and implemented their own stuff, which is perf. So perf has a huge amount of functionality and uh, the events, as we are calling them, uh, which it can record at any point in time, you can query this by just running perf list. And what you see here are just the first lines. If you run this today on a, on a high-end system, so again, your tiny little laptop might not have as many events there, although many of the events are not hardware events, they are software events. But the events which you're getting there are numbering the hundreds. And those are only though the ones which actually have been given names. There are other ways of actually specifying events, which are called raw names, so raw events, where you can program basically the, the performance measurement counters directly. You instruct Perf to do this directly by giving it numbers, which it has to put in which register, etc. So you can, with this, uh, query every single event which is available in your machine and there's a huge number of them and usually if you're just diddling around with it you will have a hard time making sense of all these kind of things which are coming out. But if you're trying to do something you just want to get an overview the good news is you don't have to worry about this in general. So there's, there's a command, a subcommand of perf called stat if you're using perf stat without anything, it will give you a nice overview with some commonly used counters and it will print out the appropriate values over the entire run of the program. So it gives as a last parameter there the sum proc stuff in the end. That's the name of the program it gets, uh, which gets executed. But you can also uh, monitor the entire system running with this tool, etc., etc. So that's all possible and easily doable. You can also specify with dash E here the events which we are interested in, in this specific instance. That's possible as well. So you see there, it specifies CPU cycles and instructions, and then CPU cycles, branches, branch misses, etc., etc. So all these kind of things. The, these are commonly defined names, and they work across architectures. That's the nice thing about perf. 
because normally these the events which are counted there when you're looking at the architecture manners of the specific processes, they have completely different names, but they have been unified in, inside Perf, many of them at least. So the interesting thing which you see here is the notation here with the curly braces. Anyone wants to make a guess what this means? Nope. So if we want to compute ratios, one of the things which I told you before is that dividing one number through another number only makes sense if they actually have been computed at the same time. So if I would instruct the CPU to count the cycles and the instructions and branches and branch misses, etc., and then compute some ratios, which you see here is happening. So you see here, for instance, 2.10 instructions per cycle, that's one of the ratios. If I'm telling the CPU to not count them always at the same time, the ratio is, at very best, it has a large error. By using these curly braces, I'm telling the CPU that these counters, which are listed inside, they always have to be scheduled at the same time. I can have multiple of these curly braces, which then each of them, each of these groups can be time multiplexed. But it means that I can definitely compute the ratios based on reasonable values. So that's an important thing. So this is not actually not that long ago. So Wayman, do you remember what, when this was added? No, but I've seen instructions per cycle be way off. And it's likely because of this. Yeah, this, this kind of thing. So this is something which was only added, I think, to Perf something like four or five years ago. For a long time, we went without that. So that's important to keep in mind when you're doing this. So the, the thing which I mentioned before that, that you have to think what you're measuring and think about what you're doing before you're computing the ratios is exactly to this. And the good news is we have ways to actually making sure this is the case. So keep this in mind when you're doing your experiments. So this was about the absolute numbers and getting overview. When I mentioned that for getting uh, spatial information, we need to do sampling. So sampling is done differently, so you have to subcommand record. It takes an event specification exactly the same way as before. So you say CPU, uh, so perf event, uh, record and dash e and then all these names, then I have a program name at the end. It runs the program and writes out something like this and it creates normally by default a, program, uh, a file called perf.data, but you can specify using a dash o parameter a different file name and, but depending on what you need. So this is then containing all the data, and you can see here, so this file is already five megabytes in size. Huge number of events are counted, and each of the individual counts has all kinds of information in them. Like, for instance, which I mentioned, where in the program it actually happened. And more importantly, on modern CPUs, not only where it happens, but where was the program before? All kinds of information is there. So. To look at the data, you don't have to do it manually, obviously. So that's the subcommand report. You run perf report, which by default you looks at the perf data file. It will spit out something like this, and where it says, oh yeah, I have two different groups of, of counters. Count the number of curly braces out there. And I can select them individually and looking at them. And at the top level, it will look something like that. So this is abbreviated. There are tons and tons of stuff missing, where it basically says, that uh, it, it sorts them by how frequently the, uh, the event was counted in certain, uh, certain parts of the program, blah, 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 etc. So this is what you can then use. And more importantly, inside the perf program, you can even go with, uh, with the cursor keys up and down here and, and actually press the key and says, show me the source code. Then it would even tell you exactly in which instruction and which, presently in which source code line uh, the events actually happen. So the important thing here is, based on that, this is not the raw data which has been, uh, uh, which has been collected. This is already pre-analyzed data. The perf program, as part of the perf report startup time, 
will uh, will aggregate data which are, or data points which it has measured, which are in the same location, for instance, the same function or a function group, etc. It will aggregate them together and present them as such, and then provide you with, with ratios, being say, basically saying, oh yeah, so and so many percent of all the samples actually happened here. That's what you can see here. And it even tries to be more helpful by showing you with rats, oh, this is a little bit much. They are over my threshold. And then you can look exactly where things might have going wrong. So I don't say that, for instance, this being red doesn't mean this is bad. It just means that this event happened there frequently. But if you have an ent in the entire program exactly one place where you're doing all the arithmetic operations, and you're counting arithmetic operations in performance counters, obviously it says it gives you a number of, let's say, 80% of all arithmetic happens in this location. And that's not bad. You have to interpret the numbers in the context of the program and what you know about it. So if you want to have something more, you can actually request the individual data uh, records by running perf script. There are a couple of arguments to that as well. So now you have access to the individual records which have been recorded and you can do your own analysis based on that. You can also be crazy like me and have written my own library to do these kind of things which is a little bit faster because this goes through a textual representation or some other form of representation of mine is faster. All right, so that was the first part. Any questions? Wait to start. Right, hey. um, I think one of your summer mentees has been looking at uh, perf record in, uh, in, in under KVM in virtualization. Um, and that's something that we've uh, wanted to, to get some better use of for some of our work. And uh, I was kind of surprised that it, it's in a very early stage. Um, I, we run all of our code uh, in virtualization in the cloud. So why, why aren't there real tools for doing that or do you not need them or what do you think about that? You can, you can run perf inside the container or inside the virtual domain. What they're looking at is measuring the virtual domain from the outside. Yeah, in, in our case we have a... Uh, so our, our custom operating system yeah. doesn't have the, uh, the, the support inside. So yeah, No, no, there's no support so we have to do this and as I said, this and is something which... If I, uh, Many of the perf events are PEBS events, and PEBS is not supported in a virtual environment on Intel CPUs at the moment. So yeah. it, there are rich perf features on bare metal, but they're not available. In the Usu future, yes. Usually, really, so I would not do really sophisticated performance analysis except if I run bare metal. Uh, just to follow up to that, if you're running a virtual machine uh, with a workload in it and then really nothing else, can you count the, actually to you, can you, can you still count those events uh, external to the virtual machine, like actually monitor the hardware and sort of by proxy uh, get an understanding of what's happening inside the virtual machine? Perth has a feature from... Perf does allow you on bare metal to reach into the virtual machine and, and be sampling events from in there. I just, I don't know if there's any overhead or lossage because of that, but. Yeah. It, it, this it, also probably depends on exactly the process of version, but more importantly, you don't, I don't think you can get the, uh, the, the, the IP recording. You don't get the LBR information, et cetera, because that's a different address space. You might be able to count the events and so on, but not really much information. So by the way, Joe's day job is to work with Perf, not mine. So he has to do all these kind of things. But when you're doing that, you Joe? Have when you are reaching into a, a guest machine and you are asking for samples, you do pass in pointers to not only to a uh, your symbol table and... Uh, yeah, but it, it, it doesn't do the resolution really, so in this sense. So there, there's a limit as to what it actually can do. Okay. Because the, 
I think the, the double page table count and so on, so allowing the work which has to be done is far too much work for an interrupter. So it, it, and this is something which probably will improve over time more and more as more of the workloads which people are interested in are in this category. In, if I remember in the, in the first days when we got VM access that we entered, none of that worked at all, ever. This was added over time. Can, can I ask another question? Sure. Um, so in, in, you mentioned the mapping from the, for x86, the sysc instructions to the, to the microcode. Um, is, so the only way that I've worked is with uh, the sysc instructions, but we know that those, those mappings can be, uh, there, you can have many, many uh, risk instructions backing. So is, is there any way to hook into the, to the actual microcode that's being executed? If uh -huh. you're an Intel employee, yes. Uh -huh. Because quite honestly, so the, the way they're, in, they're uh, testing new functionality is they can reprogram the microcode and introduce completely new functionality. So similarly, we have seen this with the security problems which we have seen in the last two years. And most of them, Intel was at least, uh, with time penalties, but they were able to fix them by microcode updates. So this thing is incredibly powerful. But it also, to some extent, explains why Intel has to go to such great length to keep up with the performance of the AMD side and so on by using all these out of order and the speculative stuff and so on in the first place. So I think AMD doesn't have such a, uh, such a highly abstractable uh, microcode as the Intel side has. They're mapping more closely to hardware. All right, so what's the time actually, Sarah? Do we have to start right away? It is 2.12. Yeah. yeah. But you're, you're, you're my room coordinator. I know, I know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So I can, I can continue. I one job and I don't yeah, I can continue right away or whether I have to give you a break. So I, I think don't know. you let people go over to the bathroom. Yeah. A little bio break? Yeah, all right. I say you have to be back in two minutes so that I can hope in five minutes I can continue. Well, I think we've gone.